I'll ring the bell. Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday worship service. I am Joe Palin, and I'll be your celebrant this morning. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all those who are here worshiping with us for the very first time. We are so very glad that you are here. If you've come in person, you should have received a welcome packet when you arrived. It's got a card in it. If you fill out that and drop it in the offering basket, you will be able to be in touch to support you in finding your way into our community. In the meantime, please join us in our fellowship hall downstairs following the service for coffee. Our welcoming committee members have yellow name tags and are happy to answer any questions or point you toward additional information. If you are joining us online, there's a link in our web, on our website to an electronic version of that same card and we host a virtual coffee hour after the service if there's any interest. So no need to log off right away. And now let's say words, our words of welcome together. We welcome you, old friends and new, young and old, to our essentially our, our celebration today. Whether today is the first or the thousandth Sunday in our midst, we are stronger because you are with us. We are one people of many beliefs, identities, religions, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all love, body, mind, heart, and spirit, just as you are. You are one. Now we will take a moment to say hello across the technical divide. First, we're going to show the people joining us on Zoom. If you're at home, please turn on your camera. Okay, people at home, now wave. Now, people who are attending the service in our building, it's your turn to wave. We do have a couple of announcements this morning. <clears throat> the Palouse Zen community invites members of the UUCP community to join them in Zazen, a sitting meditation, in the UUCP library on the third floor at 7 p.m. on Thursday evenings. Anyone interested can talk with uh, UUC members Pat Hine or myself, Joe Pallon, uh, to arrange a uh, short orientation. Uh, alternatively, you can use the contact form on the Palouse Community website, uh, palousezen.org. Next Saturday is our annual Martin Luther King Breakfast, sponsored by the Latah County Human Rights Task Force. This year, for the first time since the pandemic, they are offering an in-person option at Moscow Middle School as well as broadcasting on Zoom on Saturday, January 21st at 9.30 a.m. Unfortunately, I've heard hardly anyone signed up for the, to attend in person, and it will be such a shame for the excellent speaker, Dr. Scott Finney, uh, if the excellent speaker, Dr. Scott Finney, has to speak to an empty house. So if you're planning to attend, please consider regi re registering to do so in person. And I believe Nancy has an announcement. My name is Nancy Nelson, and I and Michelle Hazen, Michelle, are you here? Um, are the co-coordinators of you, the volunteers of the UUCP, who are making this um, building into a, a temporary shelter for homeless families through Family Promise. And we are so excited because next week, a week from today, we will be preparing our children's rooms to be turned into sleeping rooms for several homeless families. 
We haven't done this for more than two years, so we're very excited to return to this role. And I'm also thrilled to tell you that almost all of the signups are filled in. So congratulations. <laughs> and this is, this is because you are an extraordinarily generous and, and active and interested group of people. If you haven't had the chance to check out the sign up and you want to find out more and see if something is still done, check the Friday email, um, the Thursday email that came out about Family Promise or just see me. Also be watching in the future because this is something we will do four times a year as we are one of the churches that take our turn during the year to shelter homeless families. It's a real pleasure and honor and I'm so glad we're back to doing this. Thank you. Here end the announcements. We preface our service by acknowledging that the land on which our homes and our church were built was not uninhabited when European settlers arrived here with their ideas of conquest and ownership. For those of us who live in Moscow, Pullman, or other nearby communities, we live on the ancestral homelands of the Nimipu, called the Nez Perce by the French-speaking traders, the Palouse, and the Shudnitz, called the Quarter Lane. If you are joining us from another space, I encourage you to discover who inhabited or moved through the space where you now live in the times before colonization and genocide, and where they are now. We pause to remember that we live on a ground that is sacred, ground that was stolen, ground that cries out for justice, and for responsible stewardship. May our remembering help us find the courage to do our part to restore wholeness to the earth and all her peoples. We also pause for just a moment to light a candle and pray for peace. We hold in our hearts all those currently threatened by greed and imperialism, from the people in Ukraine to those in Burma and Somalia. May we commit ourselves to nurturing peace, peace in the world, and peace within. We are hoping that folks joining us via Zoom have a chalice or a candle to light and something to light it with. Let us light our chalices together. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. Please be seated. Good morning. I am the Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Stevens, and I have the incredible privilege of serving this congregation as its minister. Tomorrow, our bruised and battered nation will commemorate the life and contributions of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who wrote in Where Do We Go From Here? What is needed? is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. In these times of divisive and corrosive political theater, our democracy feels shaky to me and the fabric of our society is feeling a little frayed and fragile. But I believe that love will get us through. So today we'll ask ourselves, what does it look like to use power lovingly? What does it look like to love powerfully? And how do we work for justice without making things worse? These aren't the kinds of questions that have single correct answers. Rather, 
I'm offering an invitation to reflection, hoping that reflecting on them together might point us toward principles or practices that will support us in being brave, compassionate, and effective human beings. But first, let's sing together. Our opening hymn is There's a River, composed by Faya Touré, a civil rights activist and attorney who has written over 40 plays and 200 songs exploring themes of community engagement and social awareness. Touré was the first female African-American judge appointed in the state of Alabama. Her legal battles over the years have focused on civil rights issues, and she's argued cases including Pigford versus Veneman, which required payment for damages to African-American farmers by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You'll notice that the hymnal lists her name as Rose, Rose Sanders, which is what she was called before 2003 when she changed her name from what she considered her slave name to the West African name, Faya Touré. She gave us directly permission to sing this song and to broadcast it over Zoom. So with no further ado, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. Let's sing together, There is a River. It's funny, I can see myself really big on here and it's making me nervous. <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. Now let's take a moment to engage in the practice of generosity together. For those, for those of you able to make a financial contribution, the logistics are on your screen. We invite you to either copy down the information you need or simply go to the website to make a donation. The web address is in the chat. Those of you who are newer or visiting from another part of the country may not be aware that we typically give away all of the cash from our Sunday offering to local charities whose missions align with our values, a program called the Month of Sundays. This month, the recipient is our local chapter of St. Vincent de Paul, an all-volunteer organization that provides visits and financial support to local people in need, regardless of race, nationality, religion, or sexual orientation. If you are donating online, you can choose Month of Sundays from the drop-down menu. If you are mailing or dropping off a check, simply indicate in the memo line whether it is intended for the month of Sundays or our general fund. In the spirit of love and for the continuing work of this church, 
we will now take some time to practice generosity together. Now is the time in the service as members and friends of this congregation where we lift up our joys and sorrows. The sharing of joys and sorrows is a sacred ritual in our community. It's a time to briefly acknowledge the truly significant events in our lives. If you are someone who would rather not share aloud your, for yourself, you can send your joys and sorrows to Ryan Fury, and he'll incorporate them into a slideshow shown ne next week. Read them aloud, and we'll light a candle for you. If you're here in person and have something you'd like to share, you'll be invited forward, speak in the microphone, and light a candle. If you're joining us by Zoom, raise your hand, or tell us in the chat that you have something to share and we'll spotlight your video, inviting you to unmute, and we'll light a candle for you. We'll continue the practice of keeping the sharing of sorrows and joys separate. We'll start with sorrows. So please go ahead and get comfortable. Take a few deep breaths and check in with your heart. Sorrow comes into every life. Each of us suffers losses and setbacks. Each of us struggles, and each of us sometimes knows defeat. Together we create a circle of compassion, wide enough to hold all the sorrow in our hearts, all the pain in our lives. Today we light a candle in remembrance of Paul of Cyphel, who died peacefully on December 27th. A celebration of life will be held at this church on Saturday, January 28th at 2 p.m.
if you have a sorrow to share, I invite you to come forward now. Or if you are on Zoom, let us know by raising your hand or typing something in the chat. Joy, too, comes into every life. Hearts are made to love. This world and the people in it are unbearably beautiful. Together, we create a circle of celebration, deep enough to hold all the joy in our lives. Artwork created by our Navigators Scout Troop has been accepted into the Third Street Galleries, some of our parts exhibition. Reception for it will be held on January 19th from 4 to 6. If you have a joy, Please come forward, or if you're on Zoom, let us know by raising your hand or typing something in the chat. Well, last week we completed a wonderful bit of um, teamwork and effort on the part of the members of this church, and Eileen Smith is now safely installed at uh, Good Sam in the assisted living room 216 if you'd uh, like to visit her. Anyway, it was just a marvelous example of everybody working together and I'm very proud of us. I didn't do all that much, it was other people. Death is one of the lines that defines our existence. I told you a few weeks ago about my niece, Andrea, who started chemo and uh, cancer therapy this week. Uh, her father, who is an avowed atheist, told me yesterday on the phone he welcomed the prayers of his religious friends. For me, that's a cause of great joy. On a smaller scale, Today is the first time, thanks to the technicians, I've been able to hear without the hearing device. So whatever your volume is, guys, keep it up. <laughs> and then finally, because I find joy in so many things, it's very infrequent that a guy living in the country should have a famous senator from Latah County come to his house and straighten out the fact that his computer and printer weren't talking to each other. Thank you, David. You did a wonderful job on both counts. So some of you may remember a couple of months ago when I sent out a plea for people to contact Senator Reich to get the Burma Act out of, uh, to allow the Burma Act to come out of uh, committee to be voted on. Um, I just want to let you know I got a postcard today from the person at the UUSD who was spearheading the campaign to, to do that, who asked us to make those, those calls. Um, and she says the Burma Act passed. Uh, deepest gratitude to you and everyone who stretched into global solidarity. So yay for the Burma Act and yay for the way we responded in the midst of a time when we were all feeling <laughs> stretched. Thank you. All right. Final candle for all those joys and sorrows still too tender to share. Thank you. 
life, however fragile, is a gift. And we in this community of memory, caring, and hope celebrate this gift. Today and all days. Amen. And blessed be. I want to send us into our time of silent meditation today with the actual voice of Martin Luther King Jr. ringing in our ears. So we're going to share a brief excerpt from a sermon he delivered at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church on November 17, 1957. echo in our hearts. Our readings today are three short quotes, each meant to be a seed um, for reflection. Power is of two kinds. One is obtained by the fear of punishment and the other by acts of love. Power based on love is a thousand times more effective and permanent than the one derived from peer, fear of punishment. Mahatma Gandhi. Love is a combination of six ingredients. Care, commitment, knowledge, responsibility, respect, and trust. As you go about your life, you can ask, the action I'm taking, does it have these six ingredients? Bell hooks. We look forward to the time when the power of love will replace the love of power. Then will our world know the blessings of peace. William Gladstone. So this morning, as I've said, we'll be reflecting on the intersection of love and power. How do we love powerfully? And how do we use the power we have lovingly? We Unitarian Universalists are firmly rooted in a tradition of nonviolent resistance that begins in the Bible and stretches forward through all of human history. Nonviolent resistance requires harnessing the power of love to affect change. So let's start by thinking a little bit about power. MLK defined power as the ability to achieve purpose and affect change. Gandhi identified two categories of power in the quote I just shared, but in fact there are a multitude of ways of understanding it. In the UUA curriculum, Harvest the Power, they list five types of power that we use in leadership. Expert power, which derives from group members' assumptions that the leader possesses some superior skills, knowledge, or abilities. Uh, positional power, which stems from an authority's right to require and demand compliance. It's dependent on the official position held by the person exercising it. Reward power, um, which is based on the belief that the leader controls important resources and rewards that the followers might want. This is the carrot. Coercive power, uh, meanwhile, is the stick. 
coercive power is the capacity to dispense punishments to those who do not comply with requests or demands. Brene Brown, meanwhile, talks about power over, power driven by fear that morphs into hate, and contrasts it to power with, power to, and power within. Power with leverages connection and empathy to unite and stabilize. It values decency as a function of self-respect and respect for others. Power too is about agency. It's about choice. And power within has to do with self-awareness. It requires the willingness to learn, to grow, to change to understand ourselves better, and to seek to understand others in the same way. Our identities sometimes give us power or privilege. Material wealth gives us power as well. We have physical power. How strong are our bodies? But we also have intellectual power and emotional power. This often, emotional power often looks more like wisdom or resilience. And then we have my favorite, our human superpower, which lives in the pause between an action and our reaction, which might normally be habitual. In that pause, we have the power to stop and to choose not a reaction but a response, a loving response. In other words, we have the power of self-determination. We can't always control our circumstances, but we can control what we do and say. Just a little caveat, we can't control what we feel, Feelings just are, but we can control what we're going to do with those feelings. Are we going to stuff them or ignore them? Or can we be present to them so that the learning they carry for us can make its way into our hearts? So there's a whole bunch of stuff that I just threw at you about power. <laughs> Take a couple deep breaths and sit with these questions. What is your relationship with power? What types of power do you hold in what situations? And how do you use your power? Are there places in your life where you feel powerless? And how do you deal with that difficult and uncomfortable feeling? Things to walk with, questions to walk with in the weeks to come. Moving on to love, MLK liked to go back to the Greek and differentiate between eros, agape, and filio. King describes filio as a sort of intimate affection between personal, personal friends and eros as aesthetic love. Agape, on the other hand, he's, he writes, is more than eros. Agape is more than philia. Agape is something of the understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all. It's a love that seeks nothing in return. A love that seeks nothing in return. And then we have bell hooks telling us that love is that combination of six ingredients, right? So care. Caring means letting people matter to us, letting their condition touch us, their stories. It means letting them into our hearts. Commitment, which means sticking with someone, not giving up on a relationship just because things get bumpy. Knowledge is about developing intimacy, learning to understand one another. Responsibility is about doing our part to support the relationship, most importantly including acknowledging our mistakes and our foibles. Respect, at its best, brings us to that namaste mindset where we're able to look at one another and see not a thing or a category, but a holy being worthy of reverence and awe. And we build trust by doing what we say we will do and also by not doing the things we're asked not to do. I find that there's a dimension to love I like to call fierceness. 
love can feel soft and easy and maybe even a little slippery, but it, when it feels powerful in my body, it's very protective, kind of like a mama bear protecting her cubs. Bringing that fierce mama bear at love to bear for our own sakes, to love ourselves that way, is what gives us the strength to set and hold boundaries. It's what motivates us to rest when we need rest, motivates us to move when it's time to move. It gives us the strength to advocate for ourselves and the courage to leave situations that are, or relationships that are harmful. Now, bringing that mama bear love uh, to, to others, bringing that to bear for the sake of others, looks often like speaking truth to power. It looks like making justice. So let's take another moment to reflect on these questions. What are your experiences of love? How can you tell when an action is motivated by love in yourself, in others? Is it possible to experience unconditional love in this lifetime? Is it possible to love another person unconditionally? So I'll give you just a few breaths to think about love. And now I want to bring the two together. What does it look like when we use power lovingly? What does it look like to love powerfully? And how do we work for justice without making things worse? Does anybody else live with these questions day in and day out? <laughs> for me, to use power lovingly is to use it sparingly in ways that respect and honor the autonomy of the individuals involved. For example, when my kids were little, I learned that I had to use my power as a parent to keep them safe, that's positional power, I had to keep them safe, had to shape their character, I also had to keep my household from descending into complete and utter chaos. But I learned from my own mom that it was important to give my kids as many choices as possible. And then my kids taught me <laughs> that when I used coercive power to make them do something they didn't want to do, it didn't work. It was an exercise in frustration. Rather, I needed to use the power of love and empathy to sort of lure them into choosing the right thing for themselves. Now, I want to be clear, it's way less efficient to parent this way, and I will not say that I never fell back on that oldie but goodie because I told you so. Has any parent actually managed to avoid that particular trap? <laughs> you know, my younger son is um, about to take the LSAT and apply for law school. Uh, so imagine little four-year-old baby lawyer. <laughs> was fun. <clears throat> I had a mantra when he was four. You didn't kill his brother, you're not gonna kill him. You didn't kill his brother, you're not gonna kill him. You didn't kill his brother, yeah. <laughs> oh boy. So my kids obviously were strong-willed from the start, so persuasion, while it was less efficient than coercion, was far more effective, especially long-term. And I think that's an important distinction to hold, effective and efficient. It's more efficient to use coercive power, but it's more effective to use the power of love. Now, using power lovingly um, also requires being aware of our motivation. When we choose to do something, are we doing it for our own sake or are we doing it for the sake of others? I've occasionally used the positional power granted by that reverend title 
to cut through red tape, for example. The most memorable incident was when I had a congregant reach out to me concerned about a friend who wasn't answering her phone or picking up her mail. And this, this congregant was extremely concerned and had tried calling the police who knocked on the door but weren't willing to force entry and check on this person. She said, I don't know if there's anything you can do. And I said, well, I can try using the reverend. And so I called up the police and I said, this is the Reverend Elizabeth Stevens, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they did go over and, and um, do a wellness check. Uh, sadly, they found that the, the woman had died uh, sometime previously. So, But that was a loving use of power. Um, using power to advance our own self-interest, meanwhile, can be a tricky dance. I mean, we have to do it sometimes. But I think it's a slippery slope that can lead us from healthy self-advocacy -advo into narcissism and a destructive and toxic selfishness that preferences ourselves or our tribe over others if we're not careful. We've seen pretty clear evidence of the harm that comes from prioritizing self-interest in the opening weeks of the 118th Congress. If we want to use power lovingly, we need to question not just our motives, but also our methods. Are we being skillful? Are we being careful to respect and care for everyone involved, including those who might be on the opposite side of a particular issue? Or are we acting like bulls in the proverbial china shop, smashing through so certain of our own rightness and righteousness that we don't care who we hurt? I wonder sometimes if the resistance resistance to wokeness or political correctness, which we might also call common decency, grows out of those bull in a china shop moments. When people use shame to try to force compliance, it can trigger defensiveness and things escalate. There's a difference between calling someone out for being racist and calling someone into accountable relationship. The Consent Crew, which is an educational group that focuses on empowering individuals to connect fearlessly through supporting cultures of open communication and consensual interactions, offers these practical steps for calling someone in. First, you have to know your why. You have to get clear on two qu key questions. Why does this person matter to you? And why is this situation of significance to you? Good questions to ask ourselves before we comment on those Facebook posts. Huh? Then you make sure that you're the right person to do the calling in. Make sure you're not triggered and angry and that you have enough relational capital with the person so that they'll actually listen to you. Third, check for obstacles. Reflect on likely problems and pitfalls, things that are gonna block the conversation. Fourth, focus on the behavior. Fifth, have the conversation in person if possible. You know how many people have changed their minds because of a debate on a Facebook wall? Exactly none. Exactly none. I mean, maybe that's not true. I don't know that for sur sure, but um, I haven't seen it do much except get me agitated. <laughs> Last but not least, in the words of the consent crew, you have to find your zen. Now, that might mean meditating with Ken and Pat <laughs> on Thursday nights, but might also just mean getting grounded and centered and unafraid. You have to enter these conversations unattached to outcome, they say. Now once this groundwork has been laid, the actual calling in process consists of first sharing any fears or apprehensions, openly identifying anything that could be a potential obstacle, sharing hopes for the outcome of the conversation, and reiterating that having the conversation is an act of caring and love. And only then, after you've done all that work to lay the table, only then sharing feedback about the specific behavior. It is delicate work, whether we use the consent, uh, whether we use the consent cruise process or our own, it's delicate work. And it's not surprising that we get it wrong more often than we get it right. But we need to get it right more often than we get it wrong. So lo loving powerfully for me means both embracing that fierceness, that mama bear fierceness I spoke about earlier, but it, and also being strategic. 
think it's important that our words and actions make a difference. And that starts with believing that our words and actions can make a difference, that what we do and what we say matters. This first critical step isn't always easy. Does anyone else sometimes feel powerless? But I think we confuse lack of control with powerlessness. Just because I'm not in control and I can't make events unfold to my liking doesn't mean that my actions don't have an impact, don't make change, don't build justice. I think one of the problems we're facing as a nation is that when elections fail to turn out the way we'd hoped, we assume that the system is broken and we voluntarily give up our power by not bothering to vote, by not talking about politics, by withdrawing from the conversation. If we're convinced we can't win, we might be tempted to just throw up our hands and walk away from the game. But beloveds, we cannot afford to do that, especially those of us who live on the eastern side of the Washington-Idaho border. The work of building justice isn't about elections or legislation. It's primarily about changing minds and changing hearts. This current tribalism in politics is keeping people from talking to their neighbors. If we're all holed up in our separate camps, nothing is gonna change. We have to put our faith in the power of conversation, relationship, the power of love. We have to love our so-called enemies enough to stay in the mix. Rather than getting up on our high horse, when we've got the capacity, we need to be willing to sit down. We need to keep working to understand the fears that are driving them, while also refusing to tolerate the behavior that perpetuates harm. We have to be able to empathize, admit that we don't have a monopoly on the truth. We have to be willing to be changed if we're going to affect change in others. When I look at our democracy in this moment, I see evidence of love of power everywhere I turn. But I also see evidence of the power of love working around the edges, kind of like the Burma Act, right? It's more subtle. It's slower, it's less efficient, but it's more effective. Just like parenting, there's a temptation to embrace the efficiency of coercion and fear-mongering rather than reaching for that effective transformation through compassionate relationships, relationships that honor the autonomy of the people involved. So resist the temptation. Take advantage of our human superpower. And in that moment between action and habitual reaction, pause and ask yourself again and again and again, what is the most loving response I have in me? What is the most loving and life-affirming thing I can do? And sometimes the most loving and life-affirming thing you can do is to walk away. And other times it's to move toward and only you can know which is which. It's slow work, this building of a just and loving world. It can be discouraging and confusing and anxiety producing. So it is okay to take breaks. It's okay to turn toward joy and fun and set it all aside for a time. Sometimes that is the most loving thing we can do, but it's not okay. It's not okay to give up. It's not okay to give up. We have to keep going, keep on moving forward. We Unitarian Universalists, we are the love people. Love is at the center of who we are. It's at the center of everything we do. So be it, and so may it be. I invite you to rise now in body or spirit. Let's sing number 153, Woke Up This Morning.
Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> That's a fun one. Our closing reading is from a piece called The Call of Our Faith by Takia Noor Amin. In every moment, life is giving us an invitation. I really believe that. I really believe that in every moment, life is giving us an invitation to do the things that are the most loving and life-affirming, and that doing the loving and life-affirming thing is always the answer when you don't know what to do or if you're feeling unsure. There's always a moment of invitation to rethink or reevaluate. We're being invited into this cosmic dance of renewal and joy and justice, but you have to make the justice. It doesn't just show up without our participation or our effort. Things don't get better just by us waiting for them to happen. We all have to engage in the better making from wherever we are. And each moment presents an invitation for us to do just that. I don't want us to forget that. Even if, like me, you're tired or feeling frustrated or feeling unsure, the invitation to live our values, to live love and justice, is still there, no matter what else is going on. And now let's stand one more time to sing together our musical benediction, We Shall Overcome. May it be so. Please join me now in the words to extinguish our chalice. May the power of love run through your veins. May it make your heart beat. May it make your spirit sing. And may you know that there are so many others in this community and beyond who are singing alongside you. Go in peace. Come back next Sunday. all of you downstairs, if you've made a pledge or if you support the church in any way at all, I've got a chocolate reward for everyone. I want to announce that our stewardship pledge drive is going extremely well, and we, we really appreciate all the support we've gotten. So come down and say hi. Get some chocolate if you like. Thank you, Artie.